Wall Street veteran Bernard Madoff has been arrested and charged with running a $50 billion Ponzi scheme. Congress wants to know what caused the Enron meltdown. Now, well, the collective rage currently is focused on Wilcom. Tyco CEO Dennis Koslowski was convicted of looting hundreds of millions of dollars. This yeah. is one of the biggest fraud cases ever. Their president's a crook. Well, I'm not a crook. Find out more on this week's episode of White Collars, Red Hands. The cheer of the crowd, the sound of the music, the thrill of the choreography, to the glamour of the costumes. Theater has struck the hearts and captured the attention of the human population since the beginning of time. In the 2018 to 2019 season, Broadway grossed $1.83 billion and had audiences of over 14 million people. For theater lovers and non-theatrical people alike, you can see the allure of the stage. The glitz and the glamour caught the eyes of the perpetrators of our story today. Garth Drabinsky and Myron Gottlieb. That's awful names. The duo who defrauded investors and sent one of the most successful theater pump companies plummeting into the ground. Plummeting into the orchestra pit. <laughs> How did they do it? Find out on this week's episode of White Collars, Red Hands. We love theater here at White Collars, Red Hands. Uh, yeah, we both did it. We both it, did it. We did both slash do. We both majored in it. Well, I in I, some I, way I minored. Well, so it's because you're got only got minor roles. It's not even true. <laughs> I don't even know. It's not. I don't even it, know. It's, it's not even true. Um, no, it's more just like I wanted a job. And then we both ended up working in restaurants. So yeah, yeah. So what are you gonna do? Huh? Yeah, what are you gonna do? What's your favorite musical? This is. Uh, it's very. It's so boring. It's Rent. I love Rent. All right. Yeah. A classic. Yeah. Mine's Spring Awakening. Spring Awakening. It's the first time I identified with a musical, and I really felt something. Huh, you're just like, you were just like a horny teenager in like the 1800s? Is, yeah. that, is that what it was? In Germany. And you were like, oh man. And I was like, oh I my need God, an abortion. I'm gonna, uh -huh. I almost died from an abortion, but then she actually died. I never got an abortion. I shouldn't make that joke. I about to say, what, that was a joke? <laughs> <laughs> uh, dark humor. Am I right? Well, welcome to another episode. <laughs> I just scratched myself so hard. Of white collars, red hands. I'm Kashan. And I'm Nina. And this week, we are talking about live vents. Yeah, welcome back. We hope you had a good Thanksgiving. Yes, gobble, gobble, bitches. Uh, I'm thankful for everyone who is is here listening to this episode right now. If, you know, if I if I could give you a big old, big old smooch, I would. If I could shove stuffing up your ass, I would. She, that's, she would. I would. She would. I've never shoved stuffing up anyone's ass. You say that like it's a common thing. You're like, oh, I'm missing out. I'm really missing out on the, the ass stuffing. Ugh. It's not. I don't I don't think. Hopefully not. I'm sure someone. I'm not going to put the poll on this episode. Someone for that. somewhere. I'll put it on our Instagram story. No. I can't stop you, but <laughs> still. All right. So, Live Entertainment Corporation of Canada, or Livent for short. The hell did the T come from? I don't know. Entertainment. Oh yeah, it's just, they just they shortened live entertainment and just left everything else off. Yeah, bad. Well, what are you gonna call it? Live and core can? I don't know. Yeah, live and core can. Live and cock. Oh, that's okay. I didn't think about that before I said it. Yeah. I just said coc. Okay. Well, live and cock was uh, <laughs> founded in eighteen. No, no, nineteen eighty nine. Eighteen ninety nine. Nineteen eighty nine. It was founded by former Cineplex Odeon executives Garth Drabinsky. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to struggle all episode. Garth Drabinsky and Myron Gottlieb. They sound like Star Wars characters. They really don't sound real, especially Myron Gottlieb. Odeon was one of North America's largest movie and theater operators. Drabinsky and Gottlieb purchased the live entertainment portion of Odeon for $88 million because of internal troubles within the company. So they bought this portion of the company, made it their own thing. They did have to borrow $65 million to buy this portion of the company. And I just feel like if you don't have 74% of the funds, maybe you shouldn't be buying it. But that's just me. 
Yeah, but then if you do, sometimes you still shouldn't buy it, uh, Elon Musk. Oh. We're looking at you. God, I love what's going on at Twitter. And the fact that it's just a exploding. Fire. Oh, it's like the best thing that could have happened. I was like, yes, take it over and just, I want everything to go wrong. It's so fun. All right. Anyway. <laughs> They actually intended on their purchase to just be a placeholder, like they were just going to buy it and then it was going to be reabsorbed into the company, but it ultimately but ultimately they ended up keeping it. Now, during the purchase, they obtained um Pantages Theater in Toronto, which is now known as the Ed Mervish Theater. Terrible all terrible names again. Jesus. I guess in Canada, y'all just have really bad names. I mean, I guess like Pantages Ed Mervish. I'm sure it's not supposed to be pronounced Pantages. Pantage. Probably oh, Pontage. Is, is Toronto one of them French parts of Canada? No, well, that's Quebec, all right? Is Canada part kind of French? No. No. Oh. I think it's just Quebec. Trudeau. That's pretty French. Yeah, but isn't he from Quebec? Saskatchewan. He isn't is that French pretty, Canadian. Uh, I think I'm honestly I'm talking to my ass right here. I don't know. Saskatchewan's don't know. a pretty French name. Prince Edward Island sounds pretty pretty fucking French. Okay, well you can't tell me that Mervish isn't pronounced like Mervish and that one's even worse. Mervish. Mervish. It's worse. All right, so anyway, and they ended up also getting the rights, the Canadian rights to Phantom of the Opera. Which is actually where he just he just says, "Oh, sorry." Oop, sorry. Oh, sorry. Hey, sing for me if you want. Only okay? if you want. Yeah, like you don't have to, but it would be really nice. <laughs> 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 you can sing. Do you maybe want to come down to my basement <laughs> and have a couple of labats with me? <laughs> Livent became a publicly traded company in May of 1993. The initial stock offering, I'm sorry, the stock, stock offering raised $40 million. And they were the first publicly traded company with its primary business in live theater. I'm going to say, I don't even know if there is another one of those. Like, a, mm. I don't think like, like I think it's mostly a private business of running like live theater. Yeah. Everywhere. I mean, they were a big company and they owned lots of different theaters and they built a lot of different theaters, which we'll talk about throughout the episode. But mm. so it makes sense that they went public. But yeah, they're usually not privatized. And this is on the Toronto Stock Exchange. In Canada? Well, but then they ended up going to America. Okay, okay. Yeah, they they infiltrate our country. Just classic like, Canadians. Yeah, classic Canadians. So Livent had a three-pronged business model. Um, it was reproduction, restoration, and origination. Reproduction, they would get the rights to successful musicals such as Phantom of the Opera and Joseph of the Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dream Coat, and they would put on productions of those. What? Dream Pacote. I can't say anything today. I'm really <laughs> struggling. Restoration, they would do staged revivals of shows. And origination, they would fund new musicals. And some of these included Kiss of the Spider Woman, Ragtime, and the stage play. Very more. Which Based off Drew Barrymore? I, I should have looked up what it was about. <laughs> but Ragtime, I do know. I don't know yeah, Kiss of the Spider That one became Spider popular, Woman. right? Yeah, that one got popular. And Kiss of the Spider Woman won something. Yeah, won the Tony Award for Best Musical. Kiss of the Spider Woman won the Tony Award for Best Musical? In 1993. What the hell? Yep. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. So Liven also acquired theaters outside the birthplace of Toronto and expanded to theaters in Vancouver, Chicago, and the Ford Center of Performing Arts in New York City. And Liven would really put on a show. Their 1994 revival of Showboat was one of the most expensive productions on Broadway at the time. Ugh, Showboat sucks. <laughs> I've never seen it. I hate all musicals from that era. Whatever. Singing in the Rain is your favorite movie. Yeah, but it's not a Rodgers and Hammerstein stupid musical. Like you take that fucking back sound of music is the greatest musical of our time. I don't believe that. But my grandma does. So boring. They're all boring. Oh, let's watch Oklahoma again. You think that Marie Von Trapp taking on seven stepchildren is boring? Yes. Captain Von Trapp, they that sing hot a, piece of ass, they sing dodging a song, the Nazis? They sing a song about going to sleep, which is exactly what I do every time I try to watch it. <laughs> Halfway through, you are 16 going on fucking asleep is what it is, and I fall asleep. I never even get to the Nazi part. I'm, I'm asleep. Okay, the one scene I hate is the one with the puppets. 
You know what I'm talking about? When they're like, once was a girl in a lonely goat herd. Yeah, you lonely. Wait, whoa. Yeah, whatever. You no, lonely, I lonely, don't. Ho. She yodeled back to the lonely goat herd. Yeah, you lonely. I can't. My yodel is not on today, but. Soon her for a while with a gleaming no, goat herd. D- d- stop. <laughs> no. The part where they're hiding from the Nazis in the, in the, in the bottom of the nunnery. So I've tried to watch it three times. I legit fall asleep before they get to the Nazis every time. It's too long. It's boring. And I love musicals. So what does that say? All right, fine. So they invested $10 million into Showboat and had costs of $600,000 per week. And at the time, a normal cost for a revival would be about $3 million. Showboat all became the most expensive musical on Broadway at the time, selling orchestra seats. For $75. Oh, if only it was still like that. I was thinking that. It's like $350 just to sit at a seat in the theater. <laughs> yeah, unless you get, like, matinee. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't remember. It's been a long time since I saw a musical on Broadway. I sat in a really shitty seat for um, Jersey Boys. Ooh, love Jersey Boys. Yeah, that was with my ex-boyfriend. It was right beside a pole. It was like a half pole, half show. Nice. But Jersey Boys is great. Livevent would also run full page ads in the New York Times for their shows, which was unheard of. They didn't. People didn't do that. Um, they should have. That's actually a good idea. Yeah, it is. Um, they would also pay their actors really high salaries. Not a bad thing. Which this made them very unpopular with theater producers. And their productions were nominated for sixty one Tony Awards and won nineteen because they had the best actors because they were paying the most. Yeah, I mean. There were aspects of this that I was like, that's not that bad. But what they ultimately did was shitty. Although their productions were spectacular and thrilling, the same couldn't be said for Liven's accounting practices. As early as 1994, people were beginning to speculate that something wasn't right when it came to the finances of the company. Liven used three different ways to pull off their accounting schemes. So first, they would transfer pre-production costs for shows to fixed accounts, such as construction for theaters. Um, Pre-production costs obviously happen prior to the production going on. But what Livent was doing is they would expense these costs through amortization once the production would start. Oh, man. Yeah, we've seen that happen. Yeah. A a lot. Like, this this is... I get... The, the, from coming to, from knowing absolutely nothing about accounting scandals to yeah. now having talked about so many, this is this is this is starting to become one of the boring ones. Everyone does this. They're just like, eh. Yeah, honestly, what they didn't, what they did wasn't super revolutionary. Yeah, we'll add, crazy. We'll add the cost of something over a longer time. Yeah. The, the the creative accounting isn't seeming so creative anymore. No. Fixed assets would depreciate over their lifetime, um, which is up to 40 years for buildings. So they would move these over. They had a long time to pay it all off. Yeah. Um, this would decrease show expenses and inflate pro- profits by fraudulently amor- amortizing the production costs. Which is bad because they are a public company. Yes. And in 97, they transferred $15 million worth of pre-production costs to six from six different shows in 30 locations to three fixed asset accounts. Oh, damn. That's a lot. Yeah. Now, the second thing that they did was at the end of each quarter, Livent would remove certain expenses and certain liabilities from their books. And then in the next quarter, they would transfer those re- expenses and liabilities back into the books as original entries. Oh, man. Yeah. It's like, it's it's kind of what uh, Enron was doing with those boats. Yes. Where they just like took someone's boats and or like they gave someone their boats and then took them back to get them off their their balance sheet for end of quarter reports yes. and, then, and then bring them back. Yeah. That's exactly what Livevent was doing. But in this, I guess they're handing them like all of their organs. They're like, hey, here's the chandelier from, uh, well, from here's costumes. the chandelier from Phantom. We'll take it off. We'll, take, we'll get it back afterwards. Well, and it was also so those New York Times spreads were a part of this because mm. it was like this big flashy thing, but it was so expensive that theater companies didn't technically typically do that. Fair. So then they would move that expense over to the next quarter mm. or to amortization. Lastly, they would transfer costs from one show to another that hadn't op- that hadn't opened yet. 
to a sh- or to a show with a am- longer amortization period. This would also increase profits that co- um, in that quarter because amortization only has once happens once the production has begun. Oh, interesting. Okay. And in ninety six and ninety seven, about twelve million dollars, which was related to seven different shows and twenty seven locations, was transferred to accounts of thirty one different locations and ten other shows that were in progress. So I think if we're counting at this point, that's what that's uh It's a lot. It's like twenty seven million. What is this? Was twelve yes. million plus fifteen million? Is that what it was? Yeah, so that's twenty seven yeah. million just with this. Dang. In all, they overstated their earnings by thirty two point million dollars from nineteen ninety five to nineteen ninety eight. And in 1994, Livent kept Kiss of the Spider Woman open for months, even though they weren't covering their weekly operating costs. Um, Livent also wasn't, as I said earlier, wasn't reporting advertising rep- costs when they reported the cost of a show, which also included group sales and reporting ticket sales figures. So in 1992, I know that was weird what they were doing. In 1992, Livent had reported pre-tax earnings of $2.9 million when an all reality, their earnings were $100,000. Oh, wow. It gets worse. They continued to misreport their earnings and from 1995 to, from 1995 to 1997. And in 1995, they reported that they made $18.2 million when they earned around $15 million. Okay, well, I mean, we, that's, that's not as not crazy as, as, that, as that first number, but yeah. But wait, 1996, they said that their pre-tax earnings were $14.2 million when they actually had a loss of $20 million. Oh, geez. Yeah. So they lied about $34 million. I mean, hey, not the first time, right? No. It was the second time they lied about $30 million. I'm like, is it opposite day? I think so. No, it's not opposite day. Theater is losing money. That's true. Like normal. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah. Womp womp. Why did we do? Why did we go into that? Anyways. For the the passion. <laughs> the passion. Fuck it. I could have just had sex and got the passion I needed, I think. I was a big virgin. Oh, yeah. Have you ever have you ever hit a high C? Yeah, probably. C. Yeah. And you know what ecstasy is like. Yeah, I used to have a four and a half octave range. Damn. I was talented. Really have to add that half, huh? You sound like someone who's a who's like who's five eleven. They're like I'm five eleven and a half. Yeah. It only gets worse though. And in nineteen ninety seven the company reported a pre tax loss of sixty two point one million when their actual loss was eighty three point six million. What what happened with them? Like they they were doing so well for so long. Why all of a sudden are well, they I don't reporting think these they huge ever ass losses? W- well, I don't think they ever really were doing that well. Do you think they were lying the whole time? Yeah. I mean, like, you know, they're like, yeah, we made $2 million when we really made 100000 And they're moving all this stuff around and they're just losing money, losing money, losing money. That finally, I huh. think they got to a point where they were like, I think we have to report a loss. I mean, yeah, if you have an $83.6 million loss, that's kind of like, hard to hide, I guess. At some point, you are going to have to report a loss. Damn. They... Also, um, fraudulently overstated their assets well, from checking, 1994 to 1997. Checking off all the boxes. Oh, yeah. Each year, they overstated their assets by 5 to $6 million. And in 1997, they overstated by $23.9 million. So they also would fraudulently buy their own tickets. And from September 30th, 1997 to December 1st, 1997, there was this man that they worked with that we will talk about in a few minutes. His last name was Kaufman. Um, They used this man named Kaufman to purchase tickets totaling $381,015 from the box office at the Schubert Theater in Los Angeles. So Livent would make these purchases using Kaufman's personal credit card through checks issued by Kaufman from one of his companies. And then Livent would reimburse him or his companies. So they weren't selling tickets. They were like, can you please buy these tickets? So he would just show that like to make it look like their show was doing better than it was. And Ex- they did Excuse this. me, sir. I will take um, 
3,000 tickets to the production of Funny Girl it's in showboat. L.A., please. It's Showboat. Oh, this is for Showboat? Yeah, oh, my sure God. This is for showboat. Um, they did this because there was a theater. Um, they were worried about being evicted from the Schubert Theater because they had to make like $500,000 a week in ticket sales or something. And they yeah, were just... Well, isn't the Schubert Theater one of like the biggest theaters mm-hmm. in L.A.? Yeah. Yeah. Makes yeah. sense. And so... Um, they had to meet this profit margin and they couldn't do it. So then they were fraudulently buying all these tickets. Which, what, wouldn't you as the theater, like, realize all these tickets were being sold and then all these people weren't showing up? Or do you just not care? I like to think that that they just, like, uh, they sent one guy. They sent Kaufman and he was like, I just really wanted um, some leg room. <laughs> I wanted to stretch out. I actually, I just wanted the whole balcony. I wanted to lay down <laughs> while I watched this. What was really bad about this was the manipulations of the books. And like when they were manipulating the books and manipulating all this stuff, they had meetings about this. They would meet and talk about how they were going to move the money and have and discuss how they were going to manipulate all these books. And these are other horrible names I'm about to say. Diane Winkfine. Winkfine? I guess that's how you say it. Okay. How would you say that? No, it's Winkfine. It's Winkfine. And Grant Malcolm were two senior Livent controllers who would manipulate the books. And because there was so much falsification of the numbers, Malcolm had separate documents to track the false numbers from 1995 to 1998. It's just like the producers. Mm Mm-hmm. What does this one say? Show it to the they IRS. Probably, they probably uh, got that idea from the producers. They were like, hey, they did this in the producers. We or should do it. Mel Brooks got the idea from them. <laughs> Ooh. Maybe. Oh, wait, no. When did New- that was when did- the original. Sorry, the original producers came out in 1969. So I don't know oh, yeah, what no, I'm talking get- no, about. No, 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 no. <laughs> Because of the extreme amount of falsification in the accounting system, many adjustments were made through handwritten journal entries, which would make auditors suspicious as to what was going on. So what ended up happening was that someone from Livent's information services wrote a program that would enable the accounting staff to override the accounting system without a paper trail. Dang. Yeah. So we've they actually were... seen this before, too, like backdoors in accounting systems mm-hmm. to let people do this. Crazy. Yeah. There's also a lot of manipulation that went on between Livent and their accounting firm, Deloitte & Touche, which is a funny name, too. A lot of funny names today. Livent falsified its books and records to conceal what was actually going on. And from 1995 to 1997, either Jabrinsky or Gottlieb would sign management representation letters to the auditors that were misleading. And they would read like this. We acknowledge our responsibility for fair presentation of the financial statements in accordance with the generally accepted accounting principles, including the appropriate disclosure of all information required by statute, the financial statements of free material errors and omissions. There have been no irregularities that involve management or employees have a significant role in the system of internal controls, or that could have been a material effect on the financial statements. Lies! Statute, huh? What was I supposed to say? (laughs) Statute. Oh, statute? I'm not going to have you re-say the whole thing, but, uh, but it was funny. I think... It's like it's when Michelangelo's David lets it a little fart. It's a statute. <laughs> I'm starting to think I have brain damage. Oh, probably. It was also noted that employees of Livent would be extremely mean to the auditors and would often yell at them, and they were kind of afraid of the Livent employees, so they would rush through the audit so they would have to stop dealing with them. Wow. Yeah, they would bully them. Just like carrying your way out of getting audited. It worked. <laughs> That's the worst part is it worked. So before the company, we're going to go back a little bit, but before the company even went public, Drabinsky and Gottlieb were already getting kickbacks from the company. And we're going to bring in Kaufman. This scheme involved two vendors that worked with Livent and allowed them to steal millions of dollars from the company. They enlisted engineer Peter Kaufman and Roy Wayman, who was the owner of a construction company, to aid them in their thievery. Now, what they would do was they would have Kaufman and Wayman create fake invoices for services that they provided, 
as well as have the dollar amounts be way more than what the cost of the service would actually be. Livent would pay the vendors, and then the vendors would return most of the money to Drabinsky and Gottlieb or to Gottlieb's Canadian company, Kind Commodity Services Limited, which is kind of a funny name, too. There were over 90 inflated invoices from 1990 to 1994, and Drabinsky and Gottlieb siphoned about $7 million from their own company during this time. Damn. From 1994 to 1998, Gottlieb and Drabinsky purposely manipulated their books, and they would, under, like we were talking about before, they would understate their expenses, inflate their earnings, but this grew incredibly during the time um, – it, this grew incredibly during 1996 and 1997 when they had the ragtime and showboat running so that their shows would look more successful. And also showboat was the most expensive production. Yeah, so you got to make that look good, that right? That looks, yeah. They, they had to show, show the boat. <laughs> this was important so that they would meet um, earnings and operating projections that they were giving to Wall Street analysts. Now... This is where things start to take a turn. In April, on April 13th, 1998, Drabinsky stepped down as Livent's CEO. Michael Oritz and his company, now Michael Oritz used to be the president of Walt Disney, took his place. When Oritz took over, he saw accounting irregularities and said that earnings needed to be revised from 1996 to the second quarter of 1998. Yikes. Now, while the investigation was happening, Drabinsky and Gottlieb were suspended as employees. And Livent's stock was also temporarily stopped. Like, they paused the stock. Ooh. Which, I was, like, kind of, I was pretty impressed with this guy. I also felt very bad for him. Because I was like, damn, you took over this company not knowing it was like this? He will be fine. I'm sure he will be. He was the president of Disney. Yeah, he'll be all right. He will be fine. He's on the board of 17 companies that he gets paid millions of dollars to do that for that he doesn't even do anything there. That's true. Trust me. He's true. That's true. Now, during the investigation, it was found that Liven's debts were greater than their assets. And this caused, when all this information came out and they reopened the stock, this caused Liven's stock to plummet to 50 cents when it was trading at $10.15 and Canadian dollars before the halt. Mm. So during this time, like pretty much right away, like right after all this was discovered, Livent, like Livent was basically no more after well, this happened. Yeah, they're yeah. literally, like, because when you have more debts than you do assets, you're basically insolvent unless you can show that you correct can make money. Correct. <laughs> and in 1999, Livent's assets were sold to SFX Entertainment for $97 million. The Orvitz Group, which Michael Orvitz owned, sued Garth Drabinsky and Myron Gottlieb for about $146 million. Um, Drabinsky and Gottlieb then countersued the Orvitz Group for $130 million. Hey, how dare you find out what we were doing? Yeah. Give I, us $130 uh, million. Dollars. <laughs> nothing really came of that from what I could find. It was just like, we're suing, we're suing. And then I don't think anybody got any money. I don't know. Maybe Michael Orvitz should get something. Like they're like, "Hey, take over our company," and he immediately well, was like, "I think that he should because up. I mean, I think he should because you're led to believe that you're going to be taking over a successful company, and then you get in there and they don't have any money. I mean, that's like that's like thinking you're going to get an inheritance from your grandma, and then find out she's like hundred and fifty thousand dollars in debt. This bitch was broke. Exactly, less than broke. So. I get it. Now, November 1998, Livent saw bankruptcy in both the U.S. and Canada. They claimed that their debt was $34 million. Now, after all this happened, there was a lot of judgment from the um, auditing company, from the auditor. A lot of people judged the auditors. Deloitte and Touche. Yes. Um, because they were like, you should have caught this. Yeah, they got strong-armed out of auditing them. It is Correct. their fault. <laughs> it is their fault. So in April of 2014, Livent's special receiver received a judgment against Deloitte & Touche for over $84 million for their audit of Livent's financial statements from 1993 to 1998. Or their lack of audit, I guess. Well, <laughs> yeah, basically. The ruling was upheld by the Ontario Court of Appeal in January of 2016. 
In December of 2017, the Supreme Court of Canada declared that the liability was only in the negligence of the audit of Livent during 1997, which I do think is pretty ridiculous because they clearly were not looking at what they were doing the entire time. Um, they did have to pay out and the damages were reduced to $40 million. Um, now, Drabinsky and Gottlieb did not get off scot-free. Luckily, they do get in trouble. Um, actually, they they tried. Now, the U.S. tried to get them in trouble in 1999 when the U.S. District Court of the Southern District of New York. The United States District, District Court or, of the Southern District of New York. Okay. Yes. Um, they tried to get them for misappropriating 14. I'm sorry. Misappro- for. They tried to get them for misappropriating $4.6 million and cooking the books and hiding their losses from investors. But Gottlieb and Grubinski were in Canada. And because of extradition laws, they didn't really get into any trouble with the U.S. with this. Okay. Yeah. But on March 25th, 2009, Drabinsky and Gottlieb were found guilty of fraud and forgery in the Ontario Supreme Court for misstating the company's financial statements from 1993 to 1998. So on August 5th, 2009, they were sentenced to jail terms of six and seven years. I just love imagining what Canadian court is like. <laughs> hey, guys, you uh, you can't do that. So I... Uh, you're going to have to write an apology letter to every single one of the shareholders. Also, oh. we are, we're going to take you to jail for six, maybe seven years. It's not going to be too bad. You get a you get your own beaver. I don't know what happens in Canada. You get a beaver, maybe a goose. Some other, oh, can, some other Canadian things. I don't know. Oysters from New Brunswick. Sure. In July 2007, an Ontario judge ordered Drabinsky and Gottlieb to pay investors $36.7 million for investments lost when Livent went bankrupt. And then in the end, it was said that they defrauded investors of $405 million U.S. dollars, which is about the equivalent of $500 million Canadian dollars. And they only had to pay $37 million back? I know. Isn't that shitty? That's less than 10%. Yeah, I know. I don't think it was fair how it ended up. I mean, no. I, did, do you know how long they stayed in prison for? There's, I think they're... Like, when Because I don't think... I didn't see anything that said, like, when they got released. Oh, okay. Drabinsky completed his sentence in um, 2016. So he went in in 09, 07, uh, 09, 10, 11, so 12, they 15, served 14, the whole, 14, 15, 16. Yeah, seven years. So at least... At least Drabinsky served the whole sentence. Yeah, and I think Gottlieb, because I because I think it was Gottlieb tried to get, um, like, he appealed for parole, and they denied him of parole. Good. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we they could, we could learn trouble. We could learn something, honestly, from them about how from we... From the Canadians. Yeah, about how we keep people in prison when we sentence them to something. We keep, especially white-collar criminals, we let them all out early. Why? To make room for the drug dealers. Great. Great. Well, the show did not go on for live end. There was no encore, and in the end, there wasn't even an applause. Garth Drabinsky and Myron Gottlieb proved that even if you have a passion, you need to pursue that passion ethically. Thousands of Canadians and Americans alike lost their investments to live end and caused thousands of people to suffer. Although they got the hook! You know when they pull you off stage with the hook? Well, I don't know, but I'm sure you're very familiar with it. <laughs> Drabinsky and Gottlieb may never know the extent of their greed. They deserve only tomatoes to be thrown at them. And, and the flowers. book, which they got. And the book, which there they got. Go. Thanks so much for listening, everybody. Seeing once again with me, if you want, that is. <laughs> Our strange, well, it's not too strange. Do it. <laughs> I'm not going to embarrass myself today. <laughs> I already did five times. My power, which is totally consensual over you, ah. <laughs> grows stronger yet okay, by well, your own wish. <laughs> if you want more where that came from. Of Canadian Phantom of the Opera. Yeah. Oh, God. Actually, I don't hate it. It is, it is pretty funny. I, I don't hate it. Um, if you want more of that, though, you can follow us on social media at uh, facebook.com slash white collars, red hands, Twitter, 
while it lasts at white collars pod instagram at white collars <laughs> underscore red hands i need to update the tiktok but we are on the tiktok at white collars red hands um hey christmas it's it's coming it's coming it's gonna, Ooh boy it's uh, coming snowflakes are gonna drip down the sides of the buildings here That's in a not little how bit it works but all right <laughs> I was trying to make uh, anyway. Okay, anyway, I'm just being gross today. Um, uh, more than normal. Anyways, I don't know. Anyways, you're trying to say snowflakes are cum, bro? Yeah, yeah. That's not even. <laughs> you're not thinking straight, man. I think I need to eat. Um, <laughs> anyways, no, I had some bread. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Ow, that hurt. I didn't break it, but it hurt, bro. Anyways. Christmas is coming, and we have merch. So if you don't want a free way to support us, this is really not good. Um, if you want an unfree way to support us, go to our website, whitecollarsredhands.com, and you can buy some merch. We got T-shirts. We got hoodies. We've got mouse pads. We've got anything and everything you could ever imagine on there for your buying pleasures. And then, um, you know what? This is episode nine, and next week is episode 10. Which is the finale. Which is the finale. So if you have an idea of a show, or a show idea, a story that you want us to cover, you can definitely email us at whitecollarsredhands at gmail.com to send us some suggestions. You also can DM us on any of our social media accounts. Um, yeah, we love doing fan submitted episodes. We try to do one every season. So um, get them in there. Get them in there. Um, the other thing, too, that you can, the other way that you can support us is by um, leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Um, yeah, we love an honest review, but we love a five star review even more. Yeah, kiss our ass. I'd love that. Yeah. Go in there and just, just, yeah. Pucker up, baby. Yeah. Um, I, we were, we got our Spotify wrapped. Yeah, I was right. going to ask you And we just want to know, we were, we were the number one podcast for 14 people on Spotify. Woo! So we were in the top 10 for 155, so thank you. Hey, that's the, fun. Thank you for that. Um, and to those 14 people, thank you even more. Yeah, thank yeah. you, guys. You're listening on, Spotify is only as a small small-ish percentage of our listenership and uh and you are the hardcore fans so thank you to yeah. those 14 people we appreciate the the <laughs> hell out of you um and then uh the other great way that you can support us is by telling a friend tell a friend about us tell them to listen to us um mm -hmm. it's a great way for us to grow write it on a sign and hit your neighbor with it that works too listen to white colors red hands and then smack him in the face he'll get it yeah and i uh i think that's it i think so all right, well, we'll see you for the season finale of White Collars, Red, Red Hands. Hands.